Greetings and welcome, beloved, to You Have Your Bibles broadcast. This is the Outreach Ministry of the Community Baptist Church of Saintston, Virginia. Well, you have your Bibles. Join me in Acts chapter 20. And we want to pick up where we left off here at verse 22. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, except that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Let us pray. Our Father and our strong God, we thank you for this day and we thank you, Holy Father, for bringing us to this point in time. We are humble and grateful, but we are also eager, O oh Lord, to teach your word, preach the gospel. We ask now that you would fill us with your spirit, with wisdom, knowledge, strength, and courage to speak the word of truth in love. Be glorified and exalted through me, Holy Father, in Christ Jesus' name, amen and amen. We actually work verses 22 and, and some up 23, but I want to launch from these two verses. The Apostle Paul now is, uh, this is what I would call a Kleenex moment. He is setting his face toward Jerusalem uh, like a flint. And these men, the words that will roll off of his lips, they will fill the hearts with sadness uh, and even suspense, knowing the man that has been in their presence for a period of time. The Apostle Paul said that he is going bound in the spirit. It seems that the interpretation is that he is bound in his spirit, but he has become one with the spirit of God who has been leading him uh, from the very outset. The Apostle Paul, he said in 2 Timothy, he said that I have fought a good fight. I finished my course and I have kept the faith. The Apostle Paul is not out of the will of the Lord by going up to Jerusalem and those things that await him, these things do not bring terror in his heart. The Spirit of God has made known those things to him in verse 23, saying that bonds and afflictions await him. Now, this isn't to deter him. This is to let him know what he's about to walk into. Afflictions would be, it would just be trouble. And bonds would be bands, chains, uh, and what have you. And I guess this is the part that, you know, if I had to <laughs> uh, strip a good place for a rant, not that I am going to rant, it would be here. Hear this man of God who has been given such an awesome responsibility. And he was called to hazard his life. He was called to suffer. And that would be how he would actually glorify God, his father and our father in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have probably a very... Uh, limited amount of patience with those who see the ministry as some golden parachute or some laid a claim to fame to say, I'm someone, look at me. When the ministry, it doesn't rise to be anything greater than what it was when Christ, our Lord and Savior, was he on the earth, uh, the prophets before him, and all who have served, this work is its particular work. It's, it's specific because you have been given by God a, 
a word. You have been given a responsibility. And to see those today, and even in my past, to see those who say they have been called into the ministry, but they see this as something has everything to do with them. In other words, they approach it as if it's a career. Well, the Apostle Paul uh, would tell anyone that this isn't something that you would base a career on. This is really a divine opportunity, yea, rather even a divine appointment. And that's why he's going to say what he says next. He says in verse 24, but, but none of these things move me. What is he talking about? He's talking about the things that have been revealed to him. There hasn't been anything revealed to the apostle Paul that when he gets to Jerusalem, that things would be how he would like to find them. That there would be a great welcome mat rolled out for him. You know, and he'd go preach like we do. And then afterward, we'll go somewhere and we'll eat, you know, and then we'll just kind of, you know, lounge around. And then, you know, if it's a revival, we'll preach, you know, throughout the week. The Apostle Paul was not walking into that. He was bearing the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think I should maybe perhaps read that in your hearing. In Acts chapter 9, the Lord, he calls on Ananias, and I'm going to read this, try to read it straight through. Acts chapter 9 in, in verse 10. And that was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed. And he had seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he have authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. <laughs> You go about your business now, Ananias. For he is a chosen vessel unto me. Underscore that. He is a chosen vessel unto the Lord. To do what? To bear my name before one, the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. The Apostle Paul, I'm sure understood this perhaps better than any of us, even when he was launched out into the ministry, that he was called to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. And might I just go out on and slip this in now? You've been called into the ministry, and he's given you an opportunity to speak on his behalf, to work and to serve him, but you've also been called to suffer. And if you were called into a ministry without suffering, Go back, check that voice, and just go it on and make a note. That was not the Lord. Because if you're going to serve him, if you're going to follow him where he lead you, you are going to suffer. You're not going to be able to pack up. In other words, you're not going to be able to run with the pack. You're going to be with a crowd, but they're going to be spread rather thin. And when he sends you on your assignment, don't be surprised that, listen, it depends on the message that you bear. If you have been sent by the Lord, you will suffer. But if you get cute, if you decide you want to go off strip, and you decide you want to do what everyone else is doing, no, you won't suffer behind that. For those of you, you've been in ministry a long time and you're not suffering, let me go on and serve notice right now. You either have the wrong message or you, you were never called. Because if you believe what thus saith the scriptures, if you take these words to heart, they become not only the gospel of God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus and the gospel of Paul, but it becomes your gospel and my gospel. And the gospel is wider than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is actually, it runs through the epistles. It runs all the way to the consummation of all things because it's all good news but you just have to live it. 
you have as a servant, you just have to find out what's good. And what I have discovered, and I'm learning, oh gosh, I'm learning. I'm, I'm still, don't, 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 don't be misled by anything. But when you can get to the place where folk don't want to hear your voice, they don't want to see you coming. Listen, uh, because they remember the last time you were there, all you had was your Bible. All you had was, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you preached the gospel to the lost. But you preached also to those who are saved, who have entangled themselves back into the world. And you preached to them. And then you taught the word of God. And everyone in the room heard a word from God. No one, no one was alienated. No one, you know, and matter of fact, listen, when, when, when that happens, usually with the spirit of God being heavy on you, whether you know it or not, everyone hears and no one goes to sleep. My wife told me about uh, a gentleman who uh, this, this preacher was preaching and and whatever the Lord was saying to him, he jumped up and he just ran out of the place. He had heard all that he wanted to hear. Well, the ones that stayed, they probably, some of them wanted to leave, but the Lord had them, had them right where he wanted them. And that was where it was with the apostle Paul. And that's the way with whomever he's called into the ministry. And I want to dig in on this because you want to make sure that he's called you to this work. Because this work you will suffer. But if you're going to align yourself with everyone else and their brother, if you're going to have a message because the world sees the gospel and even what God says now, and usually folk blame that on the one who's speaking, on the preacher, on the pastor, is that that's hate speech. Well, God is angry with the wicked every day. You can call it hate speech all you want, but it's truth and it's love because God is warning the wicked. He's also serving notice on the righteous that you don't practice sin, that you don't sin. When folk know that you come and have word will travel, they are not that inclined to invite you. And if someone does invite you, you probably that's probably going to be your only invitation. If you're going to stick with the strip, but if you're going to get cute, if you're going to try to be fly and suave, if you're going to try to be, if you're going to try to get in where you can fit in, or if you already have your paycheck, here it is, or watch this, if you're preaching to get another opportunity to preach, or somebody going to call me, you know, I, I'm going to make sure I do that little thing I always do. They can't resist that. They're going to have to call me back. It's like with butter and bread, they go together. No, he's not called us to that. He's called us into this ministry. And everyone who's saved has been called into the ministry to serve in some capacity. But for those of us whom he, whom he has called to be a herald of the word of God, we don't have time to be sensitive as to who's in the room. The governor, the president, the king, the emperor. Now, we're not to be dis disrespectful we are to be loving in our presentation. But at the same time, we have to work while it's day because night cometh when no man can work. And the apostle Paul was on his way to Jerusalem and he took the information that the spirit of God gave to him. It was coming from the spirit of God. It's wise counsel to know what you get ready to walk in. But the apostle Paul said, none of these things move me. Why? He said, neither can I my life dear unto myself. Why? Because Paul is, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. For the life I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said, I don't have a life anymore. When I was in the world, I was the servant, the slave of sin. Satan was my taskmaster. I, 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 I was a slave in the world. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's my master. And for as much as the Apostle Paul and even you, brothers and sisters out there, and for as much as we are sons of God, that's the heading. That's, that's the adoption is sons of God. And it breaks out into sons and daughters. But the category under Christ 
is sons of God. It is that for as much as we are the children of God, adults in Christ, through the adoption, we are just as much servants. And the word means slave. We don't have a will anymore. It, it cannot be what I want to preach, what I feel like preaching, what I, you know, what I think ought to be taught. See, within the pastoral ministry, the church needs to be fed. We, we can't come in, and I and I heard Dr. Wiersbe say this, the late Dr. Wiersbe says, we can't come in every week with a salvation message. You can't grow the church with a salvation message every week, but the message has to have some salvation components in it, and vice versa. Paul said, I don't have a life. His life was with Christ, hid with Christ and in God. And see, that's where the difficulty comes in in this day and time. It's very hard to watch those who can say anything and everything and do almost anything in the presence of a crowd. And it's, and I'll tell you something, a microphone is dangerous. I remember when I first started in ministry. Or the urge to just say whatever come in your mind. No, you can't say whatever come in your mind, beloved. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and our congregation will, will tell you, I'll stop midstream and I'll say, no, I can't say that. And when I check it, it was something that either I'm getting ready to insert out of my own spirit or it's not of God. It's not going to advance the message. He said, I don't count my life dear unto myself. He doesn't have a life. But most of, I don't know if they'd call me their colleagues or not, but most of my colleagues, most of the folk in the ministry, that's all they have is their life. They will show you, man, let me show you how I'm living. Let me show you what I have. Let me show you where I've been. Let me tell you where I'm going. I only roll with these folk. I only go to these certain, these particular restaurants. The apostle Paul never made that cut. Well, let's put it this way. He, he, he cut, he was cut before he got on that team. And that team is going nowhere. That's a team in the world. For those who have been called into the ministry, it is a ministry of sacrifice. It is a ministry in which we will give an account of. And the apostle Paul lets us know how he was able to maximize this within our text. The same way the Lord Jesus Christ did. He set the joy of the Father before him, before he actually got to the cross. And the Apostle Paul is looking to finish his, his course, to finish well, and to please God by pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what it says here. So that I might finish my course with joy. He's looking at the end of when, after he said his last word, and he's getting ready to go, and in his case, he's getting ready to become a martyr. And if, and I'll be honest with you, if, if I had rant number two, that's the other thing. Folk approach this thing called ministry, so has hazard. Oh, I'm in the ministry now. Look at me. Look at me. What do you mean look at you? When, when I look at you, you don't look like what Paul was preparing himself for. You don't look what, like what John the Baptist who gave his head up on a charger for correcting someone who was in politics. See, if you're going to try to maneuver through the, the landmine of politics and religion and all oh, that's that, you, we don't, we don't, we don't talk about that here. No, you don't talk about much of anything here. You don't even talk about the word of God here. See, folk know you that you know, you of that ilk. They don't want to hear you. But for some reason, those of us who have the truth have been given the authorization by God to present it to the church or to a gathering, and we give the truth out. It's almost as if you hate me, but the same crowd will go over here and let someone lie to them 
send them checks in the mail, give every dime they have in their purse if they come, you know, where they are. If it's someone that's what I call a big stage person, like I heard someone say today, is that we have the largest gatherings we've ever had, but we have fewer folk going to church. Do the math. Go figure. Something's wrong. But see, he called the Apostle Paul to serve like he did. That's the key to ministry. You don't have a ministry. It's his. Paul said, well, my ministry, but I believe Paul knew that this is the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is his. The ministry is his. The word that he's preaching is his. The spirit of God is the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit. We have nothing except our obedience and our humility. The Apostle Paul has looked to the end of his ministry. Therefore, he's able to serve. So none of these things move me. Whatever happened to me, because see, the Apostle Paul knew a couple of things. One, I'm going to have to go to my own people. Boy, I tell you that crowd. Your own folk. They hard, man. Because they remember back when. And see, with Saul of Tarsus, it was just a little while ago when he was on the other side of the ledger. When he was the one who was persecuting the church. And he found out that he was actually persecuting the Lord Jesus. And when we go home to, to teach the word or to preach the gospel, it, it's, it's interesting. Because folk, they don't forget who you was. And even though your sins have been taken as far as the east is from the west, and 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 you know, and they've been cast into the sea of un you know, of forgetfulness, you've got some folk, you got some spiritual scuba divers. They'll just dive right in and say, I see it, y'all. I'm gonna dive right on in there. Yeah, that's that, yeah. And you'll come up with that stuff. So they don't want to see you coming for several reasons. But who will the Lord going send? Who will the Lord send to your people? I said this in another message. He sent a stranger. He said, we don't want to talk. We don't want to hear him talk. And we send somebody that they know, the Spirit of God, the, the Holy Father, and the Lord Jesus. Well, then we know him. We don't want to hear him. Wait a minute. You're going to hear someone. So what God does, he just... Picks and choose, and what he does, I'm going to send you someone you know. And that's what he did, and that's what he does. Verse 24, which I received so that I might finish my course of joy in the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus. This is key. He received his ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ as an apostle. Those of us who have been called and given to the church as a gift for the pastoral ministry. When we say that we are a gift to the church from the Lord Jesus Christ, all of us, every we, has to understand that one day we're going to stand, bow before him, suck dust off of the, off of the very uh, pavement in glory. And when we said that we were called into the ministry, we had better been called into the ministry. I posed the question one time. I said, what if I really wasn't called into the ministry? What if I was one of those ones who, man, salvation is so wonderful. I just want to run. I just want to run. I just want to run. I don't have no message, but I just want to run. You have a lot of folk running. They don't have no message. They don't have no word. What they have is just a lot of talk. Oh, the Lord is good. Oh, he'll save you. What else? What else did the Lord say? What is he saying to the church? Well, he's telling the church we need to repent. Because we've been sinning. While he's been working and saving multitudes throughout the nations, the church, especially here in the West, we have so much. We can sin and, and not even know we've sinned because we have so much. We have so many things moving around us. But when you are in poverty that you, you you don't have hardly nothing you know you you pretty much know what your next move gonna be but see when you get around folk we say things we think things we we we, we ponder things that we ought not ponder and sometimes we do things 
And we have sinned. We've sinned against God. We've sinned by omitting to do the things he's told us to do. To be faithful over just the little things he's given us to do. To make sure that what he told us not to do, that we stay away from it. Whatever that thing is, that we live a holy, sanctified life. It means when you get off from work, you go home. You don't have to go by, you know, the little delicatessen because a certain person is there. And no, you go home. You go home to your you go home to your spouse. And if you're not married, you go home. So you don't have to lust while you're out. We've sinned. We've sinned collectively as, as the church, and we've sinned individually in what we set before our eyes, what we will fill our spirit up with. Gossip, lies, culture, and all of that stuff. Listen to this. The ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. The grace of God is simply put in my homely uh, definition of grace. Grace is God's love at work. Through the person of Jesus Christ. Yes, of course, it is his unmerited favor. But grace is God's working. It's where Christ rolled up his sleeves and he demonstrated just how much God loved the world. And the Lord Jesus demonstrated how much he loved the world and how much he loved the Father. But in that, and I have to be truthful, he also saw how much he would gain when the church his church, the, those, the elect, those who would believe on him and receive the gospel through repentance and faith. The gospel of grace. And this is what the apostle Paul taught. This is what he preached. And he didn't have another message. The apostle Paul only had this doctrine. Verse 25. And now, watch this. Behold, look at this. I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. The apostle Paul is doing two things here. Yes, their hearts are, are very tender about this time. He's preparing them for his departure, but he's also teaching them how to stay. What do you mean? How to stay on your post. If the Apostle Paul knows by the Spirit of God that he's about to go and face adversity, persecution, he's going to hazard his life. He's also teaching these men how to stay the course because chances are they're not going to go anywhere. And if this is where the Lord has called them to, you have to stay. You have to, listen, and this is what we were dealing with on, on the Lord's Day with Moses and Joshua. Moses and Joshua, except for perhaps a very, a very small remnant, and, and the only two that went over into the promised land would be Caleb and Joshua. He was leading a bunch of rebels. And sometimes, and, and, and I'll probably let the cat out of the bag for Sunday, is that folk, when they get saved, they end up in the wilderness with their walk with the Lord, and that's where that mess from Egypt is supposed to fall off. Where that mess from the world is supposed to just drop off because we get ready to go into the promised land. And for the child of God, we have the promises that we might know how to live in a strange land. But some folk don't adjust to that very well because they still want to go back. And that crowd, and sometimes like the church, you find yourself sometimes in a work that, you know, depends on where you are and maybe the size of the congregation. It seems like folk want to do what they want to do. They talk more about the world than they do about God in the gospel of grace. He's teaching these elders, you stay the course. You do what you've been called to do. You feed the lambs. You give them milk. You feed the sheep. You work diligently to get them off of milk as soon as possible so they can get on to some strong meat. You care for them. You love them. You love all of them. You don't have no special one. 
You don't have no special group. You don't have anyone that's in that congregation that could give you an eye that would cause you to look at your notes and say, yeah, well, this is in the notes and this is what the Lord said. <laughs> but because I got the eye, I'm going to mock that off. You don't have anyone that would be able to do that. The Apostle Paul is teaching these elders how to stay. I'm getting ready to go face adversity. The Lord Jesus Christ faced it. He didn't run to it. Someone was talking about that today, how the Lord, it seemed as if he was just taking a walk through time. He just, I mean, he just, he didn't, we, we don't hear one instance where the Lord picked up his outer garment and started running. He just walked in the ministry one step at a time. He was that measured. Why? He was the son of man. But at the same time, he was the son of God. The Apostle Paul was teaching not only them how to expect him to lead, but also you're going to have to stay and you're going to have to finish also. In verse number 26, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. This part of the ministry, sometimes it gets overlooked. I remember when I was ordained, this is the scripture that was was read from Ezekiel is that at the end of the day, between your mouth and your heart and your hands, you have to make sure that your hands are free of anyone's blood and that you do not get your soul tangled up and tied up with anyone that has anything to do with being ministered to. You save yourself from that nonsense. And the Apostle Paul is saying, I've done all that the Lord has required of me. No one's salvation have I put them in a place where they didn't need to be. And the Apostle Paul was a, he was also a master teacher. He was a, he was an awesome preacher of the word of God, but he was also a master teacher. He laid it on the line. The Apostle Paul could do Bible study, and when you could, at the end, folk wouldn't have no questions. They'd just walk off, especially in this day and time. That's how he had the word down in him, because the Spirit of God was just giving it to him. He was like a, like a sailboat out on a lake, and the wind, being the wind of the Spirit, guiding him, giving him the words through his own uniqueness, through his vocabulary his reasoning and understanding, and brought him forth. And those words, as Peter said, Paul's words, they are scripture. He said, "My, I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now, for those of you in ministry, you can't have one area of expertise. You, you have these folk running around, uh, all they talk about is faith. All they talk about is love. All they talk about is this, that, and the other. Listen, you have to give the whole counsel of God. He's called you into the ministry. He's called you to give the whole counsel of God because in doing so, you give the will of God to God's people. You make those who are lost, watch this, you make those who are lost aware of their future if they refuse to repent. First thing he says here, and we're going to end here in verse 28. He says, and he's talking to the pastors. He says, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock. There has to be, there must be pastoral care that the pastor has to have over his own life. He cannot be so caught up with the congregation and meetings and conferences to the point where he lets himself go. He has to guard his own heart because there, there's one that know the pastor better than anyone, and that's God. The second would be the pastor himself. He must guard 
his heart. He has to guard his mind. He has to guard his eyes. I wrote something a while back. I saw uh, <laughs> Bishop uh, Earl Carter, and he wrote a book, because uh, I, I, I never picked it up, but sin makes you stupid. Sin makes you stupid. Just kind of let that roll around. Sin makes you stupid. You know, the problem with Samson, Delilah was set up by his uncontrolled lust that he just had to have what he just had to have. That's a pitfall in ministry. Because for every time that we go beyond the line of God's scripture and we violate his will and thought, in desire, we're setting ourselves up for what I would call Delilah in ministry. It happens all around us. So the best way to do that is to guard yourself. The same care, it, it, for those of us in pastoral ministry, our eyes are going like this all around the room. We're watching, we're looking at the door. We want to see who coming in. You know, we're sensitive to all of the movement, all sounds and all of this. We have to be the same way in our own lives. We have to know when we've gotten laxed in prayer. We have to know when we've gotten away from our time in the word and in our studies. I'm going to say that again. We have to know when we become laxed in prayer and when we have become, you know, preoccupied to the point where it's, you know, with everything else going on, we have gotten away from the word of God. We can't get away from the scriptures, y'all. We need this word because the power is in the word. The change that God is going to bring about in the congregation, he's not going to do it one without Christ. He's not going to do it one without the spirit. He's not going to do it without the word. The word, God's word. So what would be the best way to guard our lives is with the word of God. To have the word of God as Joshua, to meditate upon it day and night. Some of you, you stay up late. Are you in the word? Do you have your Bible open? Are you memorizing scripture? Are you, when you get together with loved ones, do, do you all talk the word out? There's nothing else really to talk about. We pretty much, you know, we have a low TV and TV is going out of business around here because that's eventually what's going to happen anyhow. Uh, because the news is what it is, is that we want to talk about the Word of God. Like with my wife and I, we're in the book of Daniel. Now, we, we've gotten preoccupied with other things, and we've gotten away from that study. It's things that you have to guard. Pastor, you have to guard your heart. You have to guard your mind. Because you know you. You know you. You live with you. Listen, put no confidence in the flesh. You say, oh, but I didn't arrive. You, you listen, you haven't fallen asleep yet. And you're, you're not in, in, the, in the absent to be absent from the body, present with the Lord. You still here. You haven't arrived. Don't listen. Listen, you think you can stand? Be careful lest you fall. See, pastor must guard his own life. And, and one of the ways I do it, I'm just going to be honest with you in, my, in our congregation. We have, of course, we have more ladies than we do uh, fellows. Uh, I'm not going to walk in. I don't care. I told her, I told the crowd. I said, listen, someone could come in here with a dress on and look like Cinderella. I'm going to look at you, and I'm just going to keep on doing whatever. I'm not going to speak on it. Now, I may say, oh, you, you, this, we have a beautiful congregation. That's all you're going to get. You have to be careful. You have to guard your heart. For out of the heart flow the issues. Of life, you have to guard your heart. See, sometimes what we minister is that mess we allow in our heart, and that's the mess that God says, "Listen, that's a problem for you." Then you gonna go ahead on and dump it, and if and if people really believe you have something that worthy of hearing, they open the spirit up for that garbage. I, I don't play with anything that has anything to do with flesh sexual comments because I don't do it. I don't play it. I, I, I choose my words carefully, but I, I still have to guard myself.
Y'all pray for me. I pray for you. That's what the apostle Paul said. He said, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. You're going to have to shepherd yourself in the sense that you yield to the one who's your head. You're going to have to be in close proximity with him. You're going to be, have to check in, check in with him often throughout the day. Me going along, I don't listen to no music that's, that's not going to be God glorifying and Christ exalting. Not, when I'm alone, I'm not listening to anything else. That's something you can just do for yourself. He says here in verse 28, you take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. Now, you have to watch over the flock. And I think this is where we're going we're gonna to close it. The pastor, he must, the elder, that's the man, the pastor, he's the shepherd, that's the poimen. The, the presbyteros, you, you have the uh, uh, episcopos. You have, listen, you must watch over the flock of God. You have to. And it, listen, on the Lord's day, that's only a percentage of the time. As you're going along, as members come to mind, as those of you, you enlarge your fellowships. So you may have someone, you have deacons over maybe a, a, a particular region or zip codes or whatever the case may be. As you consider these deacons and all, be in prayer. See, pastors don't, you know, I'm, I'm what they call bivocational. I have to get out there and work, okay? And the man that doesn't work ought not eat. But that's what the scripture says. So I, I've got to get out there and work. But at the same time, I have to realize that I'm still pastor. I'm pastor while I'm working, but I still have to be mindful and pay attention to what I'm doing on my job, but be mindful of the flock to be in prayer. There are times when I have to fast. There are times when I, I have to, you know, I'm, I'm led to call someone, to call someone else. See, ministry, you, it's, it's not where you, you, you just on Sunday, Wednesday night, and when we come together for maybe a you know small group session, it's 24-7. I'm the pastor 24-7. The church is the church. The church is the flock. 